Hi, thanks so much. Uh, I'm Rishi K. Shuei. Thanks, Roman, for the introduction. Thanks to all of you for, for having me and, and listening. Um, I make a podcast called Song Exploder, and it's a show where musicians take apart their songs and piece by piece tell the story of how they were made. Each episode of the show features one artist uh, breaking down one song of theirs. I ask the artist for all the individual tracks that went into a recording, and then I interview them and ask them about each of those pieces. Over the course of the episode, you hear the different isolated steps. You'll hear a guitar part by itself, or you'll hear just their vocals by themselves, or the drum parts by themselves, etc. And then you hear the ideas and the stories behind each of those parts. Um, I think the best way to explain it is probably by playing a little. So here's a clip from an episode I did with Weezer about a song of theirs called Summer Lane and Drunk Dory. This is the way I came up with a guitar solo. Instead of playing a guitar, I sing. If I just go to play a solo on a guitar, often it turns into just a wank fest, and you know, like the same old muscle memory licks you've heard a zillion times, and it's not interesting. But if I sing it, I'm much more restricted in where I can go and how fast the solo will be, um, and it's gonna have space in it because I have to breathe, and it's gonna be something you can sing along to because it was created by a voice. But guitar can go a lot higher than my voice, so when I originally scat the solo, it's in a lower octave, and then I go back and pitch it up an octave because I, I need to learn it on guitar, so I need to hear it in that higher octave. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the idea. Uh, we go through music like this, piece by piece, talking about the intention and the execution. And at the end of the episode, I play the full song, so you can hear how all those different parts came together. The hope is that when you listen, you end up gaining some unique insight into the artist's imagination, and you end up hearing that song a completely new way. So far, I've put out over 150 episodes with artists like Fleetwood Mac, U2, Lord, The Roots, Yo-Yo Ma, Bjork, and a bunch more. Like, if you're in the middle of a Spotify algorithm ruining Mumford & Sons binge, um, <laughs> there's an episode of Mumford & Sons, too. And, uh, so all kinds of artists, all kinds of music. Uh, the show's about music, but at its heart, it's always felt like a design show to me which is why I'm so excited to get to talk to you about it here. I don't really get to talk about it in this way. I'm a musician, um, but I have a background in design, and so to me it feels natural to look at the music-making process as a kind of design process. That way of looking at music really came together explicitly, though, when I started Song Exploder. And as I tried to start to figure out how to tell stories about making music, I discovered that making a podcast can be a design process, too or at least it was for me. So here's that story. I first started working on the show in the spring of 2013. I'd never made a podcast before. I'd listened to some, mostly, mostly it was This American Life um, on tour with my band, but that's about it. I didn't really know that much about how they were made. I'd certainly never tried that kind of storytelling myself. I'd never interviewed anyone, but I had this idea could there be a way to let people hear the inner workings of a song? Could that be a podcast? I'd been recording and producing music for years, so I already had a microphone, and I knew how to edit audio. And the other thing I had was this design background. Uh, that had started with music, too, for me, making posters for my band and then, and then album covers. I studied design in school and photography, and, the way, and design was the way I paid the bills at points in my life when music alone wasn't cutting it. So through all of that, thinking about design had kind of settled into my brain as a way of looking at the world. So when I tried to figure out how to make a podcast, I leaned into those instincts. Even though this is a non-visual medium, I thought I could still approach it like a design project. So with that in mind, here were the steps that I outlined for myself. First, I had to nail down the concept. What did I actually want to do with this podcast? Secondly, what was the actual content going to be, and where was I going to find it? And finally, what shape would the show take? 
What was the format and what was the feeling? I wanted to convey the information about this music making process as elegantly and as effectively as possible. So how do I do that? Okay, so let me start at the top. The concept was simple, right? What's actually in a song? The reason I thought such a simple question was worth asking is because the answer isn't simple at all. It turns out there are a lot of things in a song that you never hear. First of all, there are the stems. Um, these are just the different tracks within a recording. One thing I've discovered in the course of my DIY producing and recording is that I love listening to stems. Just listening to parts of the song on their own. It really helps at a practical level when I'm trying to write and arrange parts, but it's also just this special, joyful experience to get to stop and examine and consider the different jigsaw puzzle pieces. Each one of these pieces reveals something, and when you isolate them and you turn everything else off, you hear details and textures and nuance in the music that you never really hear when the song is fully assembled. Listening to stems reminds me of a listening experience from much earlier in my life. This is the story of Peter and the Wolf. The Wolf is played by three mean horns. Peter is played by the string section of the orchestra. so in love with that record when I was a kid, because that was really when I first learned how different instruments have their own voice and their own personality, and how they have their own function, uh, and how magical they sound like that on their own, but then how cool it is uh, to know that they're part of a larger story. Most of the time, though, listeners don't get to hear songs that way. You don't get that Peter and the Wolf breakdown that lets you hear all that magic. And another thing you don't get to hear is the truth of the work that went into a song. You know, songs can sound like they're these perfect gems that come out to the world fully formed, but they're the product of lots of little ideas and mistakes and false starts and lucky accidents, just like any great creative project. And each song represents a series of creative problems that had to be solved, but those were stories that I never, I never heard. So with these ideas in mind, these hypotheses, I set out to try and gather stuff to make a pilot. I asked my friend Jimmy Tamborello if I could talk to him about one of his band songs, because he's part of the band The Postal Service, and I knew he's a good enough friend of mine that I knew he would be patient with me as I tried to figure out what it was I was even looking for. Should I say hi? Or... Yes. Um, hi, my name is Jimmy Tamborello. Um, Hi, my name is Jimmy Tamborello from the Postal Service. We talked like that for an hour as I kind of picked my way through uh, trying to figure out how to do this. We talked about my favorite Postal Service song, um, which is The District Sleeps Alone Tonight. So we listened to the stems and we had this long, loose conversation about what it went into making it. I took home the recording of the interview and all the different sounds that Jimmy had played for me. So the last stage was trying to figure out what to do with all of this. How could I best deliver this information? So at the heart of good design is empathy for the user, right? Like whether it's graphic design or product design or architecture, the user experience is paramount. So that's what I tried to keep in mind even though I was in this unfamiliar territory. Let me try and imagine someone listening to this show and try and figure out what they need, what serves them best. I thought that there were three needs I, I needed to think, I needed to consider. Uh, efficiency, clarity, and intimacy. Um, so let me start with efficiency. Part of this show was born out of my own frustration with music interviews and documentaries. I feel like there, there are usually two options. You either get something that's short but superficial, or you get something in-depth but self-indulgent. Like there are featured music documentaries that have really interesting stuff, but they often require you to already be bought in. You have to be a big fan of the band in order to sit through all of it and get to those interesting parts. And personally, I don't have that kind of patience, especially for a band that I don't know. And I thought of other people who also might not know an artist, but would still find value in hearing how they solved creative problems. 
And I thought those listeners would be better served if I delivered only the most, informa the most interesting information and did it as succinctly as possible. Um, for clarity, I mean, this was an important part because music making can be opaque for the lay listener. There are musical terms that somebody might not know. Uh, musicians often talk about their instruments and gear and software in a way that can get esoteric and, and really boring for somebody who doesn't know about that stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm somebody who does know about that stuff and I find it super boring. Um, <laughs> so it was important to me that things didn't get too deep in the weeds. And then finally, intimacy. I, I think just for any process story, there's potential for it to get distant. To a room of designers, maybe that's a, a different story, but for most people, process stories can, can get dry. And so in order for this to be a show that I, I thought people would actually want to listen to, I had to do what I could to make them feel a genuine connection to the artist. So based on all of that, I thought of what my container had to look like. Uh, I thought about how to design to address these needs. So first of all, I had to stay focused in the interview. I was gonna ask everything I could about making the song, and that's it, nothing else. I feel like I, I hear a lot of music interviews where the artist's there to promote something, and they get asked a lot of big questions, capital B, capital Q, big questions. Um, questions about their life and their philosophies, and things that require uh, big answers. And I, I actually think there's a limit to what you can learn about someone when they're speaking in big answers. I think the quickest route to discovering what makes a person tick is to find out how they approach little decisions. It's more grounded. And so I wanted to stick to the concrete steps it takes to get from nothing to having an idea to turning that idea into something real. If you can zoom in close enough, you can see fingerprints. And if you can see the fingerprints, you can learn about the hands that put them there. But that's just half of it. After the interview part's done, the need for efficiency led me to condensing interviews and organizing them. Making something, especially a song, can be a long and messy process, and if you're trying to explain what you did, things might get told out of order, or things might take too long to explain, or things might get forgotten and then, you know, remembered 30 minutes later. So the conversations I have end up more like excavations where I'm just digging for all the relevant information that I can get. But after I have it, instead of making a listener sit through that recording, I take it all, I rearrange it, and, and try and tell the story step by step, and I introduce the music layer by layer in what I hope is a clear and logical way. I wanna take this labyrinth of anecdotes and straighten it out into a corridor. The second thing is to use show and tell. Um, by using the music to tell the story, not just punctuate, punctuate it, and, and have it respond materially to, the, to what I learned in the interview. <coughs> I thought this is what could elevate the podcast past what you might get in an article in a magazine or a website. I've read a lot of those articles, and, and it's so hard sometimes to connect uh, when someone's talking about music on a page with the music itself, um, but working in audio gave me the chance to get past that. So going back to my first conversation with, with Jimmy from the Postal Service, here's how I assembled one just an explanation of one part. There's a texture in the song that I'd heard a lot of times, but I couldn't identify, so I asked him about it. I looped a little bit of Jenny's vocals and made it into a texture in the song. That was one of the last things that we put into the district. This vocal loop comes in after the second verse when it's kind of going into the, the more dancey outro part. explain musical terms that a listener might not know, like a loop or, or a delay, or, or it might make the terminology irrelevant, which is the best case scenario, because that language is just an attempt to describe sound. So if I could just play the sound, I wouldn't have to worry as much about the language itself. Um, here's another example from a while later. I did an episode with composer Harry Gregson Williams, who did the score for the film The Martian, and he uses this term ostinato while talking about his score. And if you're a musician, ostinato is not an obscure term, but if you're not a musician, maybe you've never encountered it before. 
So halfway through the first part of this cue, the synths give over to a, a string ostinato. So this little figure, and by hearing it, you never need another explicit uh, explanation past that, and it becomes irrelevant uh, if you didn't know what it was before. So then the last piece of my solution uh, was to get out of the way entirely. I made the decision pretty early on uh, that I should take myself out of the conversation, even though I was having, conducting these interviews, for the sake of intimacy and for the sake of efficiency. If I could edit the conversation not just to organize the story, but to take myself and my questions out of it and just leave the artist's voice, I could make it seem like it's something that they're speaking just directly to the listener. Sometimes interviews feel like they're just as much about the interviewer as the interviewee. And I thought if I did that, it would feel like I was breaking the promise, the implicit promise that I was making to you. If I'm asking you to come along for the story of a song, I'm not part of that story, so I don't need to insert myself into it. So I do a quick introduction at the top of the episode, and I give some basic uh, background on the artist, and then I get out of the way. So in the end, instead of a 60 or 80 minute interview that's meandering or esoteric or self-indulgent, hopefully, the episodes are about 15 minutes of a musician guiding you through their story and their music. Um, and then there's one last tool, because despite the fact that I've, I outlined all these steps and I, I think about them, it's still hard for me sometimes to get away from my own assumptions and, and biases. They can be hard to recognize. So when I'm actually trying to put together an episode, I have a, a shortcut when I'm trying to think about these, the needs of hypothetical listeners. Um, the listeners take on a specific form. Uh, my parents. That's my mom and dad. And uh, as my biggest supporters in life, they listen to my podcast, which is really sweet. And it's also really helpful uh, because they're enthusiastic about listening to every episode, even though as people who normally only listen to Hindi music, um, they, they pretty much never know who any of the artists are. <laughs> uh, my dad knew you too when uh, they were on the show, but other than that, um, he's not up on his Bjork. Um, <laughs> so I can reliably think of them as listeners who exist without a frame of reference. Uh, and, and it just helps me so much to be, just think of them and say, what do they need explained? What do I need to include to make them appreciate this artist and this song by the time the episode is done? And my parents are my, my constant test case for empathy. Uh, although one thing my parents don't fully support is the decision to take myself out of the interviews because they're my parents. <laughs> uh, they just want more of me. Um, and I've met folks who come to podcasting uh, from radio, people in radio who've asked me about that decision too. They, they ask me why if I'm the purported host of this show, I'm not actually in the show. Um, I think it's easy to see the job of the host as this kind of constant, reliable presence, someone who's gonna guide you through the story and, and let everybody know that they're there for them. Um, this, this approach just never occurred to me, honestly. Uh, I think, for me, the job was to be there to guide people through the story, but no one should ever know that I was there. And, and I think this part of the production is what reminds me even now, five years after I had started it, how I approached the show. Um, because it, it's really like a little representation of what the job is, which is to be relentlessly empathetic to the people who I'm making the show for. And I think that's just what it means to be a designer. Thanks a lot.